this is our part of our series of seminars that are on the theme of diversity and inclusion in computing education. This is the second um, month we've done these and these run all the way up to the summer. And we're presenting these in partnership with the UK's Royal Academy of Engineering. The format we'll follow is as we normally do, and it's lovely to see lots of people returning um, from previous seminars. Uh, we'll have a 35 to 40 minute presentation. Then we'll split into um, breakout rooms. And I understand the speakers have got some suggested questions for our breakout rooms. And we'll discuss in small groups, and then we'll come back together for a general Q&A. Um, these, we've had these seminars now for nearly a year, and we consider these seminars to be a space where everybody can share their own experiences and everybody feels welcome. And I just want to um, just reiterate that we all listen to everybody else and that we um, are very open and bring a very open and collaborative and sharing spirit to these um, seminars to um, um, talk about um, computing education. So big warm welcome to Tia Madkins from the University of Texas at Austin. Also Nicole Howard from the University of Redlands and Shamari Jones um, from the Bellevue School District, Washington State. The topic is equity focused teaching practices and how educators can engage them in CS learning environments and all around you know, culturally responsive teaching practices. So I'm really looking forward to this talk and when you're ready, off you go. Thank you so much for um, inviting us, Sue, and to Diana and the entire team for inviting us and having us here today. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Okay, great. Yeah. Um, so thank you to the Raspberry Pi Foundation and the Royal Academy of Engineering um, for having us here and hosting this today. Um, we also want to give gratitude to all of the hardworking educators, wherever they are working um, in the COVID context, and to our learners. Um, and their families in this moment. We wanna honor that, um, how difficult teaching truly is in this moment. And so um, we wanna thank you for taking time out of your evening or your day, wherever you are to be here with us today. Um, I'm Tia Matkins. I'm at the University of Texas at Austin, as Sue said, and I am a faculty member in STEM education. Um, I also am a former classroom teacher. Um, I taught in Southern California and Northern California. And I'll hand it over to my um, fabulous colleagues to introduce themselves. Hello everyone, good morning, good afternoon. I am an assistant professor at the University of Redlands in uh, their Department of Teaching and Learning. Um, my research does center on uh, computer science equity, STEM equity, digital equity as well. I also look um, and examine factors related to parent involvement in these contexts. I have taught um, in the K-12 space as well. I've taught elementary school and I've also taught high, at the high school level um, and really, um, before I left the classroom, focused heavily on integrating computer science in our uh, K-6, which is, I believe, your year year one through year six uh, grade levels. So thank you for having us today. Um, and I'll echo the thank you. I'm very appreciative to have the opportunity to join you all today and uh, be in conversation with you around this very important topic. I'm Shamari Jones. Uh, I work in Bellevue School District in Bellevue, Washington, Washington State in the Pacific Northwest of the United States. Um, I am the Director of Equity and Strategic Engagement, and so my entire job oversees uh, the body of work of discovering and disrupting the inequities that exist for our students in all bodies of work, and especially in this one that we're going to be talking about today, computer science, which uh, we see an egregious disproportionality in uh, who has access and who we're attracting into fields that are high earning fields. And so I'm looking uh, very much forward to and am eager to engage in our dialogue. I come from a STEM background. I have a degree from um, a black college in Alabama in the southeast of the United States uh, named Tuskegee University. I study aerospace engineering uh, and mathematics. And so this is really my passion. Um, I morphed into education um, as I uh, grew up and found the things that really resonated best with me. And so now here I am uh, seeking to engage and learning uh, a little bit more about how to interact and impact the experiences that young people are having. Great, thank you so much. So um, 
We just want to remind everyone that we are experts um, and US-based researchers and educators um, in working with um, educators and other stakeholders in supporting um, folks to do equity focused work in computer science learning environments. Um, and we do that with a focus on students of color or minoritized learners. Um, we are not experts though in thinking about inclusion and disability studies in that sense of the definition of the word inclusion. So I wanna be really clear about that from the beginning. So we will not be able to speak much to thinking about students who are multiply marginalized in that way. Although it is very important that people are doing that kind of work. Um, but I just wanna center that that's not going to be, um, I just wanna make sure that I'm clear that we're not going to talk much about that. Um, and we, I just wanna remind everyone that we're all in different points in this journey together to engage equity focused teaching and research but remembering that we're all growing together in service of our young people and their families and communities. And so um, to that end, um, just a little bit about our agenda, we're gonna define equity and equity focused teaching. Um, and then I'm gonna hand off to Dr. Howard to talk about integrating computer science with an equity lens. And then she will hand off to Mr. Jones to talk about family and community engagement. And then we're gonna end with some practical examples. We'll also share some resources with you while people are in the breakout room, we can um, list those in the chat and we'll also share those with, um, with the Raspberry Pi folks and they can add those to the website as they see fit, okay? So just to give you a sense of where we're going. And then um, this is a quote from um, our most recent publication. Um, Dr. Howard and I wrote this alongside one of my graduate students. And this is a, a quote from that article. Um, it was part of the pre-reading for those of you that may have had a chance to do it, but there is no expectation that you did today. So we walk in with a clean slate, okay? So we advocate for the use of equity focused teaching and learning as an essential practice within computer science classrooms. And so we just wanna remind you that that's the anchor here. It is essential. It is inextricable from teaching and learning. We don't see them as separate. We're always thinking about the ways in which we can link them together. Um, something that you should know before we keep going on is that I like to have fun um, and keep it light as much as possible. Um, I also am managing like my laptop, my monitor, my printouts, everything else. And I, so I can't see the chat. So um, Dr. Howard and Mr. Jones will be helping to keep track of that. Um, but if you see me looking in all kinds of directions, it's because I really am, okay? So don't, hopefully that's okay for you all. Um, what I want you to think about right now is how you define equity. And we're gonna do the waterfall activity, which Dr. Howard showed me last week in the chat right now. I'd like for you to start typing your role. So who you are, are you an educator that's classroom based? Are you a researcher? Um, are you someone who's retired and thinking about doing this in your community? Where are you located in the world? And then think about how you define equity, but don't hit send on the chat yet. We're gonna make this a waterfall. So when I say go, everyone will hit enter and then it'll be a waterfall cascade of your responses. Okay, so I'll give you a few more seconds to get that typed in your chat box. So your role, your location in the world and then how you define equity. All right, let's go. I'm excited to see. So Shamari and Nicole are gonna share out what, you, what they see in the chat as it comes in. Okay, so I'm looking at professor, researcher in the UK, PhD students, um, more researchers, STEM educators, supporting people from different backgrounds to achieve similar outcomes is the goal. Director of curriculum and pedagogy in Canada. Yes, we're seeing opportunity, the word opportunity um, several times that word is appearing when we think about defining equity, even across all of the various backgrounds of our participants. So we see that we have that shared understanding that opportunity is essential. Everything for everyone. Gender equality. Location, income and ability equality. Great, and those will continue to come in and we wanna capture that. We wanna be thinking about the different ways that we define equity. Oh, I don't know why that's happening. Um, but we wanna be really clear that we're thinking about a justice oriented approach. And for those of you that had, the, had time to do the reading, this will sound familiar to you. So a justice oriented approach is one where learners can use their computer science knowledge in ways that they see fit to transform their communities and make connections to other um, 
knowledges that they have, right? That might be other STEM concepts or they might be integrating into language arts, et cetera. Um, it's not just also about them being the next, te next tech industry worker um, or thinking about going to make a lot of money. We often push computer science because it's something um, that's highly valued in our society, but we really want to allow kids to expand um, their views of how they're gonna use computer science. And the other thing that's really important here is this approach really moves beyond what we normally see, what we're hearing. Um, we know that opportunity is really important and access is really important. Um, but we're thinking about this in terms of a lens that moves beyond a quality of access, right? Who's, who's being offered computer science, what schools, what even courses are offered, um, and achievement, right? Thinking about test scores and, and grades and things like that. We're moving beyond those frames and thinking about using strengths-based approaches that really center students and their families. Um, and in order to do that, we really have to um, identify and reject deficit thinking. And so that's really thinking about students and their families as deficient or in need of repair, always framing things around what students lack. Um, instead, we wanna use that strengths-based approach or assets-based approach where we as educators and researchers learn to recognize, draw, and build upon students' strengths, whether that be their linguistic strengths or thinking about how we connect our course content to their lived experiences. And so um, on the next slide, I'm gonna show some images that may be unsettling for some individuals, but I think they serve as an important reminder of the kind of deficit thinking that's been evident for many, many years. These pictures come from some archival work that I was actually doing at Brunel University in London and thinking about, and one of my projects is tracing deficit thinking and relating that back to STEM education and thinking about opportunities and the kinds of, um, teaching and learning that happens in STEM classrooms, particularly in science and computer science. And so we can see there's a lot of that evidenced for centuries, right? And this book here on the left, the archivist, who's my same age, I'm in my 40s, um, she told me that this book was in her home. It was a required textbook for her mother when her mother was growing up um, in England. And so these ideas about inferiority and about who belongs are not that far removed from us. And so I think it's important that no matter who we are, we think about um, how we value certain racial, ethnic um, groups, all kinds of identities that people bring um, to the classroom and think about what those mean to us and the ways in which we think about students and their families. Um, and so it's really important in doing equity focused work that has a justice orientation that's actually key. Your mindset, your belief systems are key. You have to address those first before you can actually start to do the work in classrooms. And so I never ask people to do anything I wouldn't do. And I'll just provide you with one example of how I've done that work. I've tried to think about um, the views that I have and the ways that I implicitly and explicitly um, promote those to young people that I'm working with. When I was working in Oakland Unified School District, I was working at working with middle school students. Um, and they said to me one day, Ms. Madkins, you're too white for us. And I said, what? My mother marched with Dr. King when she was in college. My dad grew up on a farm um, in East Texas and they, the Ku Klux Klan surrounded that farm every voting day and dared them to go vote. And so I have a rich history of being very um, political and thinking like that, right? But what they were saying to me is you have deficit ideas about who we are in terms of class and thinking about um, what you think we should value. And so that to me was really telling, right? It let me know that I was projecting some deficit thinking out into that atmosphere and I had to check myself. And for any of us who've worked with kids for any length of time, they will always tell you what they think about you and you'll kind of always know how they feel. But being a good educator, being a good researcher, being a good person in the community means that you can take that feedback and figure out how it applies to your life and what you're gonna do in order to change your practices, whether that be your research and how you're um, conducting your research agenda, et cetera, okay? So moving on and thinking about that, we have to really think about what we're inviting students into and thinking about how we can work together. So we um, know there's work to do across all the key stages, right? Key stage one, two, three, four. Um, in the US, that would be like K-12, um, but we're doing that all with a common goal in mind and with purpose. We know that content and context matters. So this kind of work is gonna look different in every environment, but we know that wherever learning occurs, we have to hold each other accountable 
to actually do this work, to be justice oriented. Um, we're gonna be kind to each other. We're gonna extend grace to each other as we become more adept at this, but it's really important that we hold each other accountable. And so in order to do that, we really know that you need strategies for thinking about how to do that. So I'm gonna hand off to my fabulous friend and colleague, Dr. Nicole Howard, who is Raspberry Pi certified. She's gonna share some ideas about how we can effectively integrate CS content with, a CS, um, with an equity focus. Thank you so much, Dr. Matkins. So I, um, for some reason this morning, I can't see your share screen, um, but I know where we are um, in the uh, in the presentation. And so I just wanted to uh, talk about a couple of considerations for equity focused CS teaching. And the first one here, um, hopefully you all can see it. Um, it. It aligns with what it looks like Angela DeHart even mentions in the chat that sometimes you may not always have your act together, but that we have to offer these opportunities for students and that it's very important to challenge your own assumptions and your own biases. And so we start by by saying that that you need to think about your beliefs, think about your students' beliefs, and then think about how that can impact your computer science classroom. Um, and so that's on a level where um, we're not we aren't necessarily talking about the actual activities yet although there are activities that can be designed to support um, understanding what your personal beliefs are and understanding your students' personal beliefs. But uh, this is foundational. This is very important in thinking about the equity-focused computer science teaching and learning that we want to happen in our classrooms. Um, the other thing, uh, which you all may have may be familiar with these terms already, we want to think about um, tiered activities and paired programming. And I mentioned these because um, I know for myself growing up, it was very important to engage with my community and paired programming offers an opportunity for that community filling with students working together, working alongside one another. And so thinking about equity, not just in the community context, but how do we bring the community into the classroom pair programming is one example of how you can cultivate the community uh, mindset in computer science teaching. Self-expression versus CS preparation is also important because there are some students who aren't thinking about becoming a computer scientist yet, uh, but, but we still want to allow an opportunity for them to explore and to self-express and to understand how they may even utilize computer science concepts, computational thinking in their everyday lives, not just for the purpose of becoming a computer scientist. Uh, we have to think about um, our purpose when we approach our activities and integrate into our uh, lessons what we're doing as well because if we're preparing just for computer science and if that's the goal we should state that and be purposeful about how we do that work but it doesn't excuse or doesn't allow us to then reintroduce deficit thinking so we always have to um, check our, our biases and we always have to be purposeful in how we approach the the equity focused content equity focused uh, teaching that we plan to do in our classes. And so that leads, of course, to the last point, which is um, the equity focused lens. And so I want to move on to our next um, slide, which is also talking more about integrating computer science, but looking at um, some basic things that we should plan for. We should plan for providing a basic understanding of the computer science language for all. And so this means thinking about the flow, um, the flow of information. Are we having students draw a model? Are they programming for animation? Are we engaging in unplugged activities? And so um, you wanna also think about uh, planning the, um, how you'll teach the tools, making sure that there's room for creativity. And most importantly, we want to think about the purpose. What is the purpose for uh, what we're doing? I already mentioned the self-expression versus the computer science preparation, but also thinking about, is this an opportunity for students to um, uh, develop um, you know, the autonomy for them to build capacity, or are we really thinking about standards? And then most another most very important thing to consider is how we maintain high expectations. This aligns with not having deficit thinking as well, because we want to continue to um, encourage our students to go above and beyond what we may even imagine they're capable of doing. 
And so um, what does all of this mean? Well, the doors are definitely opening for more minoritized students to pursue computer science um, courses, majors, and even careers. Um, this all will have a meaningful impact on society. So it's a mutually beneficial uh, process here. The progress is mutually beneficial. What is still needed is a continued focus on the preparation of our youth um, as we continue to meet the challenges of not just exams and preparing students for future careers, we want to think about that computational thinking piece I mentioned. How are we even encouraging them to think about their everyday living? And we want, we also know a lot about enrollment already, at least in the US, that um, it, uh, when students are enrolled in computer science as compared to uh, uh, regular science related courses, we want them enrolled in both, but we are seeing that when the computer science courses are available, it has a heavy influence on their selection of STEM fields as their first major when they enter um, into universities. So we want to continue to increase those opportunities for students. And so we turn our attention to how we're preparing students. And that's where we talk about broadening participation. And we've already mentioned the equity focus lens and the justice approach. And that's um, a resource we'll share later, but that's a link I believe you all actually have, act, have have received this link already too. This resource will dive a little bit more deeper into uh, some practical examples of the equity uh, pedagogies. And so um, you'll you likely have noticed these different programs and uh, that are uh, out that are available for us to use with students, um, and they're provided by our different uh, third party vendors, different organizations. But they're also um, embedded within wonderful platforms that our students are probably using already or we're thinking about using with students and you'll see that they're these are different programs but they achieve similar goals they challenge the students differently so these are different pathways to computer science literacy we see flow charts scratch flow rhythm if i focus on uh, one example of the flow charting i'm going to just kind of focus on that for just a second um, that's the first image and then the third image um, you'll notice uh, first of all, that Flogarithm is, um, it's a free tool. It is PC based, but Flogarithm has embedded in it uh, 30 different languages that are accessible to young learners. So I use this as one example of a way that we can begin to show students how to map out their thinking um, using the mathematical thinking. We're thinking about uh, Boolean logic. We're thinking about operators. There are so many different um, mathematical concepts that they are integrating into this computer science experience and a young learner um, who is just starting out um, is preparing and getting ready for the more advanced programming languages they have a chance to see it in stages when you think about the, uh, the different uh, platforms and programming tools that are available now so this is when I mentioned that we want to make sure we're exposing students to the different tools and we're thinking about how we're teaching the tools in order to um, open the doors of opportunity so that we can maintain the high expectations and expose them um, to even more advanced programming languages so um, with this particular concept there are different um, mathematical pieces, but I'd say the, the mathematical hub of the exercise is situated within the condition statement for the programming loop and understanding how to use the um, Boolean operators and the logic to evaluate the condition statements as true or false is a direct way of assessing um, the mathematic concept for students and determining whether equations um, involving addition and subtraction are true or false. And so we're using computer science in a math class or math context, which is uh, very powerful for a learner when you think about integrating. Um, there are some other ways to introduce language arts as well, um, and so I'm happy to share those later, but I'm watching our time here, and so I want to go ahead and move us forward. And I'm now handing over to um, our colleague, Shamari. Okay, everyone. Um, just breathe for a second, because as linear thinkers that we are, um, those of us who are in the realm of computer, computer science, technology, and STEM, um, we sometimes uh, encapsulate our thinking into a technical problem that we must solve. And some of these uh, challenges that we experience in uh, our delivery of and who is involved in uh, our technology programming, uh, especially computer science, stems from some places that uh, we must explore a little bit more greatly. And so 
in the chat, I'm going to read it out loud as well. In the chat, uh, I copied and pasted from um, a former PowerPoint presentation that I gave uh, given to an organization. And this is a quote uh, directly from students within our organizations around um, their experience and their definition of race and equity. And this is blanketing every subject matter that they're going to be engaged in. Um, including that that entails uh, computer, computing science, math, and STEM. And so equity is the fair treatment, access, opportunity, and advancement of all people, while at the same time striving to identify and eliminate barriers that have prevented the full participation of some groups. Improving equity involves increasing justice and fairness within the procedures and processes of institutions or systems as well as the distribution of resources. Tackling equity requires an understanding of the root cause of outcome disparity within our society. And so just chew on that for a minute. And this comes from our kids. I try my best to follow the frame of mind of um, nothing about us without us. We have to involve our students in their voice in uh, helping to resolve some of the challenges that we feel that our students are facing. You know, without their voices, we're not doing a service to our kids, we're not doing a service to their families and nor our communities. And so, Dr. Howard put a slide up, um, which really does uh, speak a bit to uh, some of the disparities that really exist within our community. I have very firsthand experiences of parents without backgrounds in the utilization of technology and their inability at times to be an equal partner in the education of their students. We need our parents to be equal partners. We need them to be uh, in the realm of a minimum understanding where to get access to the supports necessary to support and empower their students. And so uh, when COVID hit, um, it was tragic for our community. We have a, a very highly affluent community within um, the Bellevue, Washington State area, very high tech. Microsoft here is here, Amazon is here, um, lots of Google uh, is here. And so we have people who uh, migrate to our community or immigrate to our community with lots of great access to the resources they need for they and their children to succeed by whatever their definition of success is. And on the flip of that, we have communities within this region that do not have access that may also be immigrant communities, but without the same uh, former access to the technology experiences that they needed in order to get our high paying high wage jobs in our community. And so we see this really big gap of once COVID hit, we did a uh, computer uh, technology distribution to all families who did not have access only to discover that many of our families had never turned a computer on in life. So imagine if a computer lands on your doorstep and you have no idea what to do with it, it becomes a brick, right? And it's a brick that your family member cannot help support your student in helping to understand and helping to manifest whatever it takes for that student to be successful in setting and keeping the pace within that classroom space. So I think about how much effort we put into creating platforms for kids to access resources for the classes, resources for attaining education, reading, mathematics, what have you, um, and other tools that may be utilized to help support their education. Uh, and parents can't access how to get to the grades. Parents can't access how to get to a better understanding through Google even of how to help support that kid. Uh, on the next slide, we have a, a few practical examples of um, how this shows up and what types of things we could focus on uh, in service of helping to support more greatly our community. And so we think about practices and protocols that um, will help to benefit us more greatly in uh, the family and community engagement aspect of this world. And I'm gonna rope bullet point number four and bullet point number one um, together because a lot of our uh, responsibility as educators is to ensure that the whole child is being served. And that whole child includes the family members that are in that child's family. And so I think about the pre-service teacher education and I've had entree to many opportunities to speaking at universities and in particular speaking with our teacher candidates that are soon to graduate only to discover that very minimal curriculum that they experience 
uh, in their four years of education is focused uh, on how to serve our families and how to serve our full child. If the people who are on the front lines, if our most valuable asset as a school district, which are our people on the front lines, are not trained and are not well equipped to engage with our family as a whole, then we will not see an advancement of our students finding their way to accessing opportunities like computer science, mathematics, and other high-tech skilled jobs when they are not given the understanding that it is built for them as well. Um, we must build community around this. Uh, we've got to find some platforms to bring in our corporations. I'm very, very lucky in Bellevue that uh, we have such a high-tech influence in this community. And so we have substantial partnership all the way from breaking ground on building a new school building through the technology that's instituted into the program. We have, you know, because of our fortunate position, we have access to free resources um, as an organization. And we try our best to roll things out in our community in a manner that supports uh, our students and their growth. This last slide here, um, I think about this uh, as I looked at that bullet point number three that was on the former slide, innovative professional learning opportunities. Um, it's such a big deal for giving us, uh, giving our students the opportunity to really um, learn and grow alongside some of the things that our teachers do not quite understand. I was reading a comment in the chat just a little while ago um, about a teacher and their feelings of discomfort when engaging in subject matters that um, some of our students may be interfacing with or experiencing themselves. Uh, and I think about that in a manner of how we oftentimes don't um, explore alongside of that young person and grow with them into whatever it is that they need uh, for being successful in the field that uh, they're, they're interested in. I think about in one of my schools, we have uh, Cisco Systems as a program that you can get a certificate in uh, out of high school. And that's pretty special because you graduated 18 with a Cisco Systems degree, uh, not degree, certificate. And you can easily go right down the street and work for Google at 18 years old, making $85,000, $90,000 a year. And then you look at the, the demographic of who's in those type of programming. Um, and there are no black kids and there are no brown kids or kids who identify as Latino or Hispanic. Um, and that is a challenge for our future state um, because we're gonna sustain the exact same way that we have for a multitude of years of who's in power and who's giving access to that power. So our responsibility as educators uh, is most definitely to find ways to be innovative in our professional development with other teachers, bring people along with opportunities that we can roll out to kids and expose young people to, ways to really fold in um, the whole child and their family members along the pathway of folks really having an equitable experience as defined by the students to even the playing field. Um, thank you, I'll move on to the next slide. Uh, so this last one, um, I didn't explain very well, but it was an opportunity for me to um, really interface with kids and expose them in the way that I'm asking you to do. And so I galvanized kids and took them to the community college for a series of workshops and opportunities to engage with uh, men who, this is a, this one in particular was for, for young men, but with men who were from varying backgrounds to give them a sense of, I can be um, as connected to this thing that I know nothing about as this gentleman who's presenting it to me, who has a degree experience and is working in that arena. And so think outside of the box, we've been given a box to work within, and now we have to break that mold and find ways to uh, be what we need to be for our students. Great, thank you so much, Shamari. Um, we're gonna move now into thinking about some practical examples um, as we close um, out our 40 minutes that we have together here before we go into the breakout rooms. We wanna just give you a couple of examples of thinking about the ways that you can build classroom community um, and think about um, some ways that you can connect CS content to social justice issues and other ways to integrate this justice oriented approach. There's not one way to do it. Remember that context matters. So you're gonna think about where you are working, whether that's teaching and working with young people or whether that's engaging in research or being out in the community. And so it's really important that all of us, no matter what kind of work that is, that we're self-aware, relational, mindful, and intentional. And I'm happy to talk more about that 
during the Q&A. Um, if we go to the next slide, um, we really wanna be thinking about these three things in terms of both our teaching practices and what we're trying to research and better understand about equity focused teaching in computer science classrooms. One, we really wanna connect with students' cultural practices and lived experiences. And we wanna do that without appropriating, right? We wanna do that without essentializing. And by that, I mean, we, are, we do not make assumptions about who we think kids are. We have to get to know them. And so that goes to the third bullet point there around fostering and maintaining relationships with students, families, and communities. We begin to learn what those fluid cultural practices look like what are students doing at home? What are they doing out in the community that we can bring into the classroom and find ways to connect to the content that we're teaching? Um, and then we really wanna think about empowering students to become change agents. And by that, we simply mean, we want them to use their computer science and other STEM knowledge to really transform their communities in the ways that they see fit, whether that's, um, learning how to code um, and to build an app um, that can document injustices that they see in their communities, right? We've seen that happen before. Whether or not it's thinking about um, helping the tech industry to think about ways that technologies are indeed racist or help to promote that and figuring out how to undo that, how to disrupt that. And so bringing their perspectives, their expertise, their experience as young people into those spaces, right? And so helping them to understand there's an expansive way in which they can use that. We have some more um, practical examples that we can certainly share, but what we'd like for you all to do now is I think we're coming close to the end of our time there, Diana, am I correct? So, okay. Um, and so we wanna give you some um, ideas around um, what you might discuss in your breakout groups. Before we do that, I'm just going to hand off to Nicole to talk a little bit about teacher education and what she's done with the Makey Making. Am I saying that correct? Yep. Yes. Okay. So in um, this picture happens to be, um, we're using Makey Makey, but we've also used Raspberry Pis in our classes. And so um, just in short, what I've done is we're preparing our future teachers. I've immersed them in um, the learning experience of our students, of their future students, and taking them through some of the um, equity focused activities that I would hope that they would then design for their students. And it has um, been a very rich um, experience. I continue to do this today with our with our students, um, and it's complex because it's virtual. Uh, but I will say that it is uh, I built community, help them build community as they think about how they'll take a lot of what we've talked about today into their own classes. Um, I've also encouraged them to think about um, going back to the idea of innovative professional learning opportunities. I've encouraged them to think about creating their own coding club. Um, this is something I did while working in one of our school districts here is instead of it just being a student's coding club, having it a coding club for our educators um, as well. So a time for them to come together and continue to explore um, as they're learning because someone mentioned earlier that you may not know all of what you're planning to teach as you become um, a computer science teacher more so when you're at working with the younger students so having those opportunities to explore um, are beneficial ongoing we want to continue to explore in the same way we want our students to thank you so much for that um, we're going to skip through these slides, but we will share them with you. Um, they'll be available on the website. We're also going to put some resources into the chat for you while you're in your breakout room. So for those of you that have the option to do the same chat feature, it will be there for you. Um, as we wrap up and go to breakout rooms, we want to think about um, a couple of questions. I'm going to see if I can screen share again. And again, this is that thing of keeping it light and fun. Um, it happened. I got a yellow error message that said, you're stop sharing. I'd never seen that message before, but this is what happens. And when we are real with ourselves and with our students, with our grad students, with other researchers, it makes the work more meaningful. And so I just keep reminding you of that. Life happens. I think all of us have relearned that during this COVID environment. And I think that's actually central to this work, right, is thinking about who we are how we are similar and how we're different. And so I want us to really keep coming back to that. I saw a question in the chat about what do you do when you don't live in their neighborhoods? You go hang out, 
with them. You don't just show up unannounced, obviously, but you can conduct a home visit. You can ask if it's okay for you to come and do a virtual visit. Um, and when it's safe to do so um, outside, you can actually go. I've done that before. It's a great way to get to know your students and to follow them into thinking um, into what they're doing outside of your classroom so that you're seeing them in a new way, but also figuring out how to connect that back to the work. And so I'm gonna to try to screen share one last time. If not, Nicole is ready to do so. So as you go into your breakout groups, you're gonna discuss these three prompts and you all can start wherever you'd like, whatever makes sense to you and your group members. But we want you to think about this related to your role. So I had you share those out at the beginning, so that was kind of salient to you, but also thinking about um, other people that you might be working with um, and how they might be doing this work alongside you as well. So the first one is think about an upcoming lesson or a set of concepts or topics that you will teach in the coming weeks. What are some ways that you can revise that lesson to be more equity focused? How do you think your students will respond? And so this is thinking about for those of you that are educators in classrooms, this is a question that you might want to consider. Um, and then researchers, you might want to think about how might you design a study that's related to what's happening in that classroom or in a set of classrooms where there, they, maybe teachers have worked together to revise a unit? How might you approach studying that in a way that's also equity focused, but that brings to light the great work these folks are doing? And then thinking about realistic ways that we can better engage with our families and communities um, and the kinds of responses that you might anticipate um, as you start to more deeply engage this work. And then finally, if you're thinking about professional development and what you might do to support other educators or, or families, community members in doing this work with something that's worked well in the past, how can you use that model, build upon it to build capacity to further engage this kind of work? And then what kind of supports will you need from administrators, your districts, school leaders, et cetera? Or what kinds of research might you do around that? Okay. And I'll turn it back over to Sue. Thank you all so much. That's brilliant. Thank you very much. We all do a, a kind of a, a silent clap or whatever, because we're all on mute mostly. Um, thank you very much to all, um, all three of you. That was really interesting. And so um, I don't know if everybody managed to take a copy of those questions, or um, but there's lots to think about as we go into breakout groups. So um, before um, Diana just um, does, does the magic thing, um, just to let you know, there is a, there'll be somebody from Raspberry Pi Foundation in each of those groups to, to help you facilitate conversation, make sure everybody, you know, everybody feels listened to. And when, when you come back in, a, um, in 15 minutes or um, whatever the time is, um, please come back with somebody nominated to ask uh, your one, the one or two questions from your group. So in your groups, have a discussion, come up with one or two questions that you want to ask, and then um, I'd, you know, be, then, then nominate somebody who's going to ask that question um, to our three wonderful speakers. Welcome back, everybody. So your instructions were to um, have a discussion and, may, and, and nominate somebody to ask a question. So who would like to be first? Oh, Oliver's got his hand up, is that right? Um, yep. So Oliver, do you want to go first? You might want to say who your, whether your question's for everybody or anybody particular, in particular, question from your group. Um, yeah, we had a really, really interesting discussion and a, a sharing of experience from, you know, across the world, particularly sort of looking at uh, issues from a US perspective and from a UK perspective. Um, I guess the question was, um, how do we um, reach the parents who, um, uh, yeah, there's maybe a, a bit of a question and maybe a bit of a, of a kind of a challenge. Um, how do we reach the parents that, um, that, that can't engage um, or, or that really are, are not engaged with, um, with what's going on in education so for, for some of them uh, you know there's their, their time is very much taken up their capacity is taken up with just you know working and um, being able to keep going um, others have very negative views of school and education perhaps um, you know sometimes sometimes perhaps 
justified by their own experiences. Sometimes they've just got negative views and, and it can be quite confrontational trying to bring um, uh, schools and, um, and those parents together. So, um, you know, how, how can we really do that when, when it's difficult, when perhaps people try to engage with parents, but really are not getting much back or even getting very negative um, energy back from them? Uh, I'll take a stab at uh, beginning um, to answer this question, and then uh, my colleagues hopefully will uh, chime in as well. Um, I think that you're not going to get every single parent um, to engage in the manner in which you'd like to engage, but it doesn't mean that they don't want to engage. And so uh, a part of the strategy here is building bridges and not borders, right? So we have lots of borders that exist um, that prevent our families from feeling a level of comfort of engagement, right? And so it'd be your responsibility to discover what strategies between you and that uh, family member parent uh, will work best for that parent, right? It may make you uncomfortable and that's okay because our key stakeholder is that family, you know, as a whole, the entire unit. And so um, there may be an opportunity where we're um, um, drowning them with, with um, um, access to things that they don't even want, like scale back. And let's ask, what do you want? What do you need? How would you like to be involved and engaged in the uh, education of your student? You know, And who do you want it to be? I would love to be it, but if I'm not the one who makes you feel comfortable, who would make you feel comfortable and engaging with you on a consistent basis? Um, and start there and see what the parents um, feel. I cannot attest to the fact that every single parent uh, is gonna want that, um, but there are, you know, uh, the, the general um, consensus amongst parents is we wanna be supportive for our children. Uh, someone put in the chat and I uh, just responded recently, we have some parents that, you know, at times are not that supportive parent and family member. Um, you may not sway them towards being that resource, but it won't be because you didn't try. I appreciate, um, and, and I saw something that Shamari also put in the chat, and so I'm glad that he um, chimed in to respond and gave uh, that insight. Uh, I, I do feel as though, you know, being a former classroom teacher and then now in um, higher ed, you know, in teacher education, I, I have experienced the pushback from parents as well, and I do feel that it starts, it doesn't start at the moment where the pushback happens. And so it's us thinking about building relationships with families from day one, because the trust is important. And if they trust us, they trust um, what we're introducing into our classroom. So it's about the communication as well. I do think if you build it, um, as someone also said in the chat, you build it, they will come along. Uh, at some point, and if they don't, also as was what was stated in the chat, our students are our first priority, making sure that they are um, taken care of. And it does uh, require us to um, prioritize self-care and taking moments to breathe in when we have those those situations because we know it, it doesn't result in anything fruitful if we have a contentious relationship with our parents so it's also choosing those battles wisely but i would say starting from day one with building relationships and getting to know your families it, it definitely can help that's great thank you can i'll go to another question um, and I've got Kiki, Tom, and Haley now on my list in that order. So, Kiki, are you doing to ask your question next? Sure. It, it piggybacks, I think, a little bit off the initial question in the kind of where do you find scenario. But um, I am from uh, I'm from Make Code, and I create curriculum. So while I'm not in the classroom equity and providing equitable resources are really important. And one of the things we like to do is, is kind of test with people, but it often turns out that the people we most need to test with in order to make sure our stuff is equitable are the ones who are hardest to find. Often the people who we are not already reaching are, um, they don't feel like part of the community. So they're not actively there for us to reach out to quickly and ask questions. So how do we reach out to people who don't already feel like they're part of the group? Where do we find them? How do we engage them and let them know we really wanna hear from them? 
Um, I can take a stab again. Um, recently, like I haven't even executed this yet, but I have finished compiling a, uh, a group of um, advocates who have applied to be a part of a family uh, advisory committee for my organization. And that committee will serve as a resource for our school board, our superintendent and cabinet, um, and my department. And what I was very intentful in doing was ensuring that those who apply were representatives of the varying bodies of work that we, um, that we operate in or we oversee within our organization, and especially um, having present, or representation from those who uh, represent groups who are uh, historically minoritized and marginalized within our system. Um, and the hope is, and we haven't again executed, I've uh, completed the process of accepting the uh, 16. I had up to 16 candidates that I wanted to accept. So I accepted those 16 out of 40 applicants. I vetted them. I had a team of people who interviewed, um, or excuse me, who uh, evaluated the applicants. And we came up with this robust team who will be our resource for reaching back out to the community. So folks we selected are representatives of that community in which they serve, um, in which they're coming from, um, who may have uh, circumstances that are of challenge to them that are generated by the school system. We wanna hear from them through a vessel. If we can't reach them all, at least we can reach someone with the hope that that information will spread. You know, But we have to put forth innovative ideas to reach our community because as uh, the former speaker said, we've got families who want nothing to do with the school district. They have been historically traumatized themselves and they won't even step foot into our doors. And so how do we support them and supporting their children? We may need a representative. And so uh, that's our course of action. I, I would only add uh, one thing to that. And I know that this is tricky too, because we oftentimes don't want to um, go into our students' homes through our students, but this also speaks to the relationships that we build with our students. They will share some of the things um, uh, it, so they'll share the voices of their families and of their community with you if you invite them into that conversation and invite them to do so. So you may not hear directly from their families at home, but you can um, get some idea of the perspectives or some idea of the thinking and, and, and in order to integrate um, their homes into your classroom experience. So I think it just goes back to also that point of building that relationship with your students. I think that's a great question. Um, so I appreciate that question. Here we also have, I um, mean, in, in the U.S. where you have the, the LCAP goals, the local control accountability, um, where you have these goals of in, including the parent voice and including the voices of the families. And so they find very innovative ways to get to the families to find out um, how to support them. And I know it's complex when we talk about digital equity. And so they are definitely thinking, we're thinking about um, more nuanced ways to bring their voices in. Great, thank you. And thank you, Kiki, for your question. I'm moving to Tom. You ha have a, your hand up. Hi. Um, yeah, sure. So uh, we also, um, we were in a group that was uh, full of UK people. So we were very interested in the US context and hearing from your research and, and your practices. Um, and I think this is also what, what our discussion was about. So how can we here in the UK learn from the community programs that are going in the US? So um, it was, so maybe do you have any examples about programs that were working really well in the US uh, when it comes to community learning and um, yeah, including the families in the learning as well. So we can uh, increase, increase student intake um, for CS education. So um, yeah, just asking for some examples uh, in the US context of like what worked really well or what were some programs that were successful. You know, one for me um, that we, I don't practice personally in uh, the organization that I'm presently in, but communities and schools um, is a pretty fantastic uh, concept that has spanned across our country in a way that um, focuses on the school building being a hub for the entire family. Um, before school, during school, and after school, spaces that are set up for family members themselves to come and learn and to be a part of this environment or this sort of communal, communal 
uh, togetherness and feeling affirmed and supported and ultimately empowered. Um, and you know, what is it like as a student to have your parent down the hall socializing and mingling with other parents you're getting your act together that day you know like my mom's here oh hell no like <laughs> i'm not acting up today um but like there there's a there's a, a really great promise in providing space for everyone from wherever they come from in life the opportunity to feel comfortable uh in a unified space So one community, I don't know if many of you are on Twitter, um, but if you are, and if you have not had a chance to join um, the CSK8 chat, um, they um, have really great ongoing conversations around some of the ideas that we discussed, but I'm even thinking about how do you find a, a PLC, a community that might be engaged in um, discussing some of these things. They do talk about, you know, for us, it's the elementary middle school, so the K-8 grade levels, but they also do touch on some uh, things for high school as well. I'll drop some information in the chat on that community. The right. last one, even though this is old, um, I shouldn't say old, this has been around for some time, but uh, if you have an opportunity to do so, just investigate the Harlem Children's Zone. Um, uh, it's it's a you know a few blocks in Harlem where folks have brought an entire community together in every aspect of that community from families to students to businesses to educators and beyond um, in the serve in service of supporting uh, the student and the whole child you know towards their um, uh, towards their individualized success and so uh, it may be a model that's very very difficult to replicate without an entire uh, group of individuals supporting that effort, but it's one that we should aspire towards. That's great, really helpful, thank you. Um, I'm moving over to Haley for your question. Hello, um, I'm gonna lower my hand, okay. Um, yes, so there's sort of three questions, but I think they're all related to a kind of structural, structural issues. So I'm gonna kind of incorporate them into one, um, which is, um, and we know you were, you were talking a lot about um, equity, not just being access, which I completely agree with. But I think that there are some things that, you know, at the moment we have situations where students don't have home devices and they can't get to school. Um, and then, you know, there's also structural issues in perhaps you might be advocating for young people, but the people in charge aren't listening to you. Um, so we were wondering, you know, what we can do in those sorts of situations and also if there's anything we can learn from schools that you were talking about where you're in, you know, an area where there's lots of tech and people working in tech, what can we take for people who are in those areas that don't have that sort of background? Um, so I think they're all sort of structural issues, so I hope they all hang together in one question, okay. Yeah, anyone else want to start? Um, I think that, um, yes, we're very fortunate <clears throat> to have such access. And I think that we are the rare one percenters, you know, in our country that, um, that are able to and capable of uh, such ease of reach to um, the resources that are emerging as what all students need for their future in our world. Um, and so I'm just like, I take a few, you know, we had a little bit of a brief conversation before this uh, PD started um, and I, I take a few really positive things from COVID. Um, one of them is that I get to work from home and I don't have to be bothered with getting up and putting on clothes and leaving the house every day. Um, and the second one is the utilization of technology uh, in a manner in which we can access greater amounts of people to be a resource to our kids, right? And so how are we now utilizing this brand new platform to zoom in or, or, or Microsoft's Teams in um, a gamut of people who have expertise and interest in these areas who have uh, skin complexion similar to those who look like me and similar to students who sit into that minoritized uh, space. Um, we have to now start utilizing our innovation as an opportunity for education in ways that we haven't, right? And so um, let's, again, like we've got to bust this box apart and just go uh, a little bit um, wild on the opportunity, knowing that, you know, we can always scale back, but 
we won't not have taken advantage of something that uh, is sitting right in front of us. Does that answer your question, Haley? Is there a second part to that? So yeah, that was that was the the part about the kind of being in in the area. But I suppose one thing that is a problem with with what you're saying there and the kind of online learning is that there are some young people who don't have the access to the devices. Yeah, uh, and so um, you know we haven't we you know we resolve the problem because we have the resources to do so. We have the school district next door to me, which is Seattle Public School. That's our biggest school district in the state. They don't have the same resources we have. And so um, they struggled a little bit with the rollout to technology. Uh, a solution to that is many of our, and I'll say with an emphasis on elementary students, many of our schools are outfitted with um, resources to computers, laptops, iPads, et cetera. And so we, even with COVID opened up um, social distancing spaces that folks, families, and students can come in and utilize the technology resources in the school building space. Uh, we provide transport. There are, you, you said it, there are layers of barriers to the success of this. So then we provide transportation for families who um, need to get to this particular space. You know, we, we do send home, we send home a computer and a hotspot, but sometimes folks don't have that. But, you know, when you get to a space uh, where you're able to do so, like we partner with T-Mobile, you know, and they gave us a bunch of hotspots that we can use until, you know, we got back into an in-person and building space. And so um, you may not have the exact resources, but there are some resources. And how do you galvanize your community enough to discover what those resources are um, that you can, you know, sh uh, sh shift over to your students? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Oh, go on, Nicole. It's fine. <laughs> you no, know, I was just also going to share that um, one of one of the things that happened as a result of us being virtual was um, here in California, a, a county of educators came together. So it's the Inland Empire Computer Science Equity Task Force. And they brought together educators, coaches. Um, I'll drop their, their Twitter handle because they haven't built out a website yet, but it's um, several different districts. I can't even tell you how many schools have come together um, in order to talk about how to solve some of these concerns, Haley. So they're communicating across um, spaces and taking advantage of the virtual opportunity and one thing they have been talking about still even though we should have the one-to-one -one device thing figured out they're still talking about those unplugged activities and how to level them up so that when students do have access to the tech that they're able to transfer the computational thinking from unplugged to digital that's great um, I'm watching the time, I'm conscious of time. I think we probably um, just have time for one more question. I think in the chat, Catherine, you said you wanted to speak for your group. Catherine? Yeah, sure. Thank you, Sue. Yeah, so um, we nominated a spokesperson, but he had to uh, go off and, and do something else. So I volunteered to take over. Um, we spent some time talking about the third question in the prompts, thinking about um, teacher professional development um, and specifically it came about from the context of some of our group members in Canada where um, last year coding was introduced as a compulsory compulsory element in math education so it's still quite a new subject for teachers to be thinking about how they're going to teach it's still quite new in terms of developing professional development to support that need um, and I guess really our question sort of hangs around that was if you were setting up um, a professional development um, course or activity for teachers from scratch what is the, the the big recommendation what is the one thing that you would make sure to include to make sure that equity focus is at the heart of that that's a that's a big question, Catherine. Obviously, <laughs> um, I think um, what has worked well for me in in working with teachers and professional development and doing this particular kind of work where you want to center justice is modeling, modeling, modeling. And I think that goes across the board in teacher education. But I think also um, the debrief part of that. So. Um, thinking, being really intentional as you work with teachers to show them why you're putting together different parts of the lesson and thinking about that and how it might look different in their context. 
Um, the other thing is giving them time to rehearse. I know that's big in the teacher education literature is thinking about rehearsals, but we often don't have time for that. Um, especially when it's like a one-off kind of teacher PD, it might be like a one Saturday, six hour session, right? Um, but actually carving out space in that time to do that for teachers to rehearse, to see how difficult and uncomfortable it feels for all of us to do that, but that you get better at it over time. Um, and thinking about um, just providing some um, even clips of good teaching that they can draw upon and having a bank of those things I found to be really helpful. I will drop in the chat as well, a link that um, one of my um, undergraduate research assistants worked on where we were looking at a particular curriculum for high school students um, across three years and trying to do our best work to connect social justice topics to each of kind of the big content areas. Here were some things that were in the news or just more broadly thinking about structural racism, et cetera, some things that you might be able to tie into the curriculum. And that gives teachers a place to start in terms of brainstorming ideas and working together and then people kind of flourish from there. That's great, thank you. I'm afraid we've, we've just about run out of time. Um, so um, can we just say thank you again to our three wonderful speakers? Um, I can clap. But, um, you have to turn on your um, mics to be able to, to clap. But uh, it's just been wonderful. And there's so many resources that Tia's been putting in the chat as well. So um, loads and loads of, um, of, of resources for us to look at. So thank you very much. Really interesting questions and answers. Thank you. Um, the conversation doesn't end here. Um, the, the Tia and Nicole have shared their um, on the screen, you can see their Twitter handles and do tag RPF seminars. And you can sign up for our um, research update newsletter if you want to. And uh, we continue to have seminars. So in the, in the one on the 2nd of March will be from Jaquita O. Thomas from Oberon University, who's speaking about designing STEM learning environments to support computational algorithmic thinking um, with respect to black girls. So um, I'm really um, hope that you'll come back and join us again. And um, any just want to say thank you very much. You can turn your mics on and say thank you and hello and goodbye to and good evening, good morning, wherever you are. Um, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much. <laughs>